segment five, where we go <laughs> from here, uh, quotation, Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana, what we've seen in the past year, what I call shock and awe statism, has put the American experiment at risk. For the first time in my life, the country faces survival level issues, close quote. Melodramatic or accurate? I think it's accurate. If we continue on this path, and this path means uh, fiscal irresponsibility, very large increases in expenditures, not dealing with the entitlements problems that we have, Social Security uh, and the Medicare and Medicaid being the most important, obviously. The new health bill is not going to bend the curve down. I don't think anybody believes that. Even if you believe that the... Bend the curve of costs. Uh, the cost. Right. I mean, even if you believed, even if you believed that this was budget uh, deficit neutral or even reduced the deficit, you have to remember that it's still an increase in spending of a half trillion dollars. So it's only deficit neutral because it comes associated with very large tax increases. All of those things, I think, are prescriptions for an economy that's going to grow much less rapidly in the future. The problem is not just at the level of government. When the economy grows less rapidly, obviously that puts fiscal pressure on us because it's harder to balance the budget. It's much easier to uh, create an environment where you stay with low deficits when the economy is growing. But the main thing is the standard of living. If you just look at individual standard of living and you ask where will our children be relative to where they could have been had we maintained the low tax, high growth, open economy policies that we had in the past, uh, I think it's going to be quite different. I think that we are, we are at serious risk. We have wide swaths of the economy under state control and direction. And there's not been a clear exit strategy enunciated by this administration for many of them. I think that's deeply unfortunate. Even if they think they're going to take time, then lay out an exit strategy. It's going to take 18 months or something like that, but lay it out in tiers or something of that sort. I think that's a major, major problem. And they seem to be bullying every sector that tries to do something in the normal course of business. Now they're going after uh, BP. BP, insurance companies, et cetera. BP deserves some attention. They, made, they, they did some things that they probably shouldn't have, and certainly there's an ecological disaster and they should be held accountable. On the other hand, um, we have the large fiscal issues. And so if you could think of, a, there's no worse time to be expanding the government right. than w as we're heading into the baby boomers retirement and we're going to have the extra demographic pressures on top of the rising cost pressures in health care and the rising real benefits for beneficiary and social security. Two basic remaining questions, only two. As a matter of pure economics, what should we do? And as a matter of practical politics, how can we get it done? So give me a, Ed, give me a nice tight summary statement of what we ought to do. I would say two things. One is we need to reform our tax code and two, keep our taxes low. So when I say reform our tax code, uh, there's an issue of what should be the appropriate kind of taxes that we have. We're, a far, we're far from the optimal tax structure. Mike spent much of his career studying taxes. Uh, I was on the president's tax panel before going to the government. And there are many things that we could do to reform that that would be very beneficial to the economy. Uh, the second thing is keeping taxes low. And there's only one way to keep taxes low. You can't keep taxes low when you have spending high. If spending grows, there will be natural pressure to raise taxes, to close the deficit gap, and that's going to be a, a reality. So what we have to do is we have to get control of our budget. Uh, I'll let Mike talk about the politics of it. <laughs> well, let me just say that I, I generally agree with what I had to say. I think, and I think it's substantively much easier than uh, they're letting on. Because they put in all these new programs, all this big expansion. Right. I think we should reverse much of that. I think that any change in the health care system has been narrowly targeted. Right. Okay. And I think our attention should be on controlling rising health care costs. In Social Security, we could index, we could index the uh, initial benefits by prices rather than wages. Nobody's benefits would go down. Everybody's benefits would be at least the current real level of benefits. And that would solve all the Social Security's long-run problems. Uh, we should be getting much more, uh, much more rigorous in our evaluations of these programs, and the government should be scaling back. And partly for emergency reasons, we've got a whole slew of things from education to infrastructure to a variety of other things that have been justified as if resources are free, and they're not. At CEA, you're working in a White House, which means yeah. this is not pure economics. You're paying, you're at least aware of, intensely aware of the surrounding mm -hmm. politics. Let me put to you two strains of thought. All right. 
One is, noted by Mike in writing in February, you write, Mr. Obama's programs increase the fraction of people getting money back from the government, more money back from the government than they pay in taxes to almost 50%. Just as the demographics on an aging population will drive it up further. Argument, we've already passed a tipping point. Roughly half or more than half of voters have already been turned in effect into clients of the federal government. And once that happens, you're, as a political matter, you're not Europe yet, but as a political matter, it is really hard to reverse. Viewpoint one. Viewpoint two. Governor Haley Barber of Mississippi, who was Republican National Chairman in 1994, when Republicans recaptured the House, said this is the best moment, not long ago, for Republicans since 1994. Former Governor Jeb Bush of Florida said he senses that people would be willing actually to permit cuts in entitlements for the first time perhaps in his entire political career. Tea Party movement, the, emerge, the election of Scott Brown from Massachusetts, uh, for the first time, Gallup show, first, the first time in years, Gallup shows that more people call themselves Republicans than Democrats. So you've got this strange, a coexisting strains of real pessimism about what's already happened in the country with enormous hopefulness that there may be a decisive movement against, against the welfare state 70 years after the New Deal. How do you read it? How do you read the current situation, Ed? Are you from our start? Yeah, I see this. <laughs> no, I'll be happy. On you, when it comes no, I'll to stop, politics, I'll be well. happy. I'll be happy to give you my opinion. You right, go, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. So first of all, I think it's very dangerous society to get into a position where more than half the voters uh, get more back from the government than they pay in taxes. That's real. That's a serious. That, that's problem. real. Some of that is a, a lot of the temporary stuff Obama did. So if okay. we can end that, we'll get back down to around forty percent. So I think we have a window, and that window is maybe you know the next few years, five or ten years, if we can get this under control. If we then get well into the baby boomers' retirement, it's going to be very, very difficult to start uh, curtailing Social Security and Medicare growth. Not the levels, but the growth so, uh, per, per beneficiary. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity. Second of all, I think people are aghast. I think Obama badly misread the country. He thought this was an FDR moment, that everybody would move left because mm -hmm. of the problem. They'd want and welcome this government with open arms. And people are aghast at the things that have been done, from the bailouts to the spending to the deficits. And they're very concerned for their future and their children's future. And I think that there's an opportunity to, cha to channel that into a constructive, more moderate, more modest, but much more effective government. Sounds pretty chipper, Mike. Yeah, pretty... I, I'm, I would say I'm even more opti optimistic Are than really Mike. I, uh, in the long run, I am. And I, I have a lot of You're the opposite in... of the Keynes. In the long run, we'll, well... All be dead. In, in the long run, <laughs> things will work out. Huh? I, I, have, I have a lot of faith in the American people to, to have long-term wisdom. And while... Uh, people panic in the short run. There's no question that this was a period during which panic was rampant. Uh, I think that over the long haul, people will realize that the United States has been successful primarily for one reason, and that is that we encourage individual effort. We encourage people to go out, be entrepreneurs. We encourage people to find their own way, and we help them when they need help, but we don't do that to excess. Um, I think people understand that's the right formula for the United States. I think people will push back in that direction. I hope that President Obama uh, will, in the second half of his term, understand that in the way, same way that President Clinton did in his later years as president. I think that he moved, as Mike said earlier, President Clinton moved to the right, and he did so wisely because he understood not only the mood of the country, but he also understood that that was the way to successful economic growth. Ed Lazier. Michael Boskin, thank you very much. Pleasure, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.